Well, thank you very much, Brad, and good afternoon. Well, one of the least uh, appreciated emigration pr uh, parties of 1845 was the very last one to leave Missouri for California that year. Uh, is this a little better? Okay, sorry about that. Well, this party led by Lansford Hastings was very unusual in many ways, as you'll see. Today we can reconstruct this trip from scattered information from many sources, including some recollections by two members of his party, uh, Napoleon Smith and William Mendenhall. And then we can see how these experiences might fit into Hastings' early thoughts on a shortcut around the Great Salt Lake. Now, Hastings had previously led a group of about 110 emigrants to o Oregon in 1842 and guided about half of them south to California the following spring. On returning home to Ohio via Mexico in 1844, he set to work writing his well-known Emigrant's Guide to California and Oregon. The book was published in mid-April in Cincinnati. It presented California as an idyllic destination occupied by a lazy Mexican population soon to be displaced by a republic controlled by industrious Americans. Now, while Hastings was in Ohio in the spring of 1845, he met Samuel Brannan, who was visiting from New York. Brannan and his friend William Smith, Joseph Smith's sole surviving brother, were the two most prominent Mormons in the eastern United States. Brannan and Smith were the publishers of an influential Mormon newspaper in New York, and Brannan was on his way to Nauvoo, Illinois to meet Brigham Young. During this meeting with Brigham Young, Brannan discussed Hastings' latest plan, which was to pilot a large party to California that year. Meanwhile, Hastings had traveled north from Cincinnati to St. Joseph's in Michigan, where he recruited the first five men for his next overland trip. They would meet him in Missouri in July. Now he hurried east to New York, where he arrived before the end of May and was publicizing Oregon, California, and his book to whoever might be interested. Brannan returned to New York the next month, and at once articles appeared in his newspaper describing the far west with advice on getting to California. He included lengthy excerpts from Hastings' new emigrant's guide. As July began, Hastings was still publicizing his book in New York City. Addressing a large Mormon assembly, he presented his plans to lead a substantial party to California that summer. Hastings may have wished to coordinate an overland migration of Mormons with an ocean-bound group led by Brannan. But Brannan and his party would not depart New York by ship for San Francisco until February of the next year. Now sometime before mid-July, Hastings finally decided that he had better leave soon for Missouri if he was going to make that overland trip in 1845. Uh, by July the 25th, he had arrived in St. Louis and addressed the public meeting at a courthouse, at the courthouse. He was described as an elegantly dressed, tall, fine-looking man with fine brown hair and beard. A local paper related, as we are informed, an expedition will leave Independence about the 10th of the next month for the far west. We should judge that it was somewhat too late in the season to start out on such a journey, as it will be winter ere the points of destination be reached, thus subjecting the emigrants to unnecessary exposure and hardship. The first or the middle of May is the time that is safest for these expeditions to those remote parts. And indeed, Hastings had written the same thing in his newly published Emigrants Guide. But he was a persuasive speaker who knew how to excite his audience. He informed them that 
Uh, he urged immigration as a means of extending civil and religious liberty. Such words would have greatly resonated with his willing recruits. Missouri in 1845 was raging with the ideas of manifest destiny and what they called California fever. Hastings wanted to arrive in California before the anticipated enormous Mormon emigration that he still predicted so he could provide them with a planet town site and benefit financially as their agent in what would surely soon become an independent republic. He had already written letters to John Sutter and John Marsh in California, and then, who then relayed the information to Thomas Larkin, the American consul in California. Marsh wrote, it is highly probable, almost certain, that he is now on his way to this place with a numerous company of immigrants. It is said 2,000, principally families from Ohio and Kentucky, mostly of good character and some property. In early August, Hastings and several other enthusiastic immigrants bound for California made their separate ways by steamboat from St. Louis to Independence, Missouri. A local newspaper related the, re reported the progress of their preparations. We understand that Mr. Hastings is now in our town on his way with a company to California. He expects to complete the trip in 70 or 80 days. The outfit for each man is no more than can be conveniently taken on pack animals, as he is determined not to be burdened with many, if any, wagons. His camp is in the neighborhood of Fitzhugh's Sawmill on the Santa Fe Road. But by the middle of August, he had attracted fewer than two dozen interested men. Hastings' party finally left Independence on Sunday, August the 17th. The very late uh, departure date again attracted the attention of the newspapers. They wrote, the season of the year for such a jaunt is unusually late. They seem to think not and appear determined to show the world that nothing need prove an obstacle, which reminded the immigrants, they said, of the farms they had left in the East. Here they sat down to eat what Mendenhall described as the first square meal that they had had since leaving Missouri. The next morning, on Christmas Day, they crossed the American River on the final short trek to Sutter's Fort. It began raining steadily as the first downpour of the season started unseasonably late. Simultaneously, the first storms covered the mountains in a heavy blanket of snow. John Sutter wrote, noted in his diary if they had arrived one day later, they would have been cut off by the immense quantity of snow. I kept the whole party over winter, some of them I employed. Now Fremont, accompanied by Kit Carson and about 15 others, had arrived here on December the 10th, but stayed for only three days before leaving to find the majority of the party who were mapping a more southerly route into California. During his first month in California, Hastings stayed for the most part at Sutter's Fort, as did the other recent immigrants. Then, on December the 15th, Fremont returned and was greeted with a salute from Sutter's cannons. He had still been unable to reconnoiter with the other portion of his men, who had taken an even more southerly route into California than Fremont anticipated. Hastings, no doubt, used the opportunity to compare their recent routes. He was well aware that for much of their time on the California Trail, Fremont's men had been not too far ahead. But now, for the first time, he could, he could gain specific information on the trail south of Great Salt Lake and west. Hastings' idea of a shortcut was still quite vague. Its advantages had not been considered important enough for him to even attempt it on his journey west. But Fremont had actually traveled most of the route and had specific notes on the terrain and the intermediate distances. There's no reason to doubt that Fremont would have told Hastings a story similar <clears throat> to what he would very shortly tell Thomas Larkin, 
who would then relate this directly to James Buchanan, the Secretary of State. Uh, quote, uh, Captain Fremont passed south of Great Salt Lake, having taken a route supposed to be a desert, but which made his distance to California eight or nine hundred miles less. He describes the new route he followed far preferable, not only on account of less distance, but it is less mountainous, with good pasturage, and well watered. And Fremont wrote a similar description to his wife just a few days later. Then after four days at Sutter's Fort, Fremont departed on January the 19th down the Sacramento River to find his missing men. Hastings was left behind with confirmation of exactly what he had hoped to hear and from the mouth of America's most respected pathfinder. This inaccurate description would dangerously mislead Hastings. He would soon travel, tell travelers that Fremont discovered this trail and found it to be an excellent one. In reality, the trail would cross <clears throat> almost 80 miles of an acrid salt plain devoid of any grass or water. Immediately following Fremont's uh, January departure from Sutter's Fort, Hastings and Bidwell started to lay out a town site they called Suttersville on an elevated location on the nearby Sacramento River. Land records indicate that Sutter had already conveyed a half square mile of land here to Hastings in December of 1845. Based on what he had heard from Hastings, Jacob Lease and Sonoma Noted in a letter to Thomas Larkin, uh, quote, two ships sailed in August last for this land with all kinds of cultivating equipment and seeds. For this purpose, Captain Hastings has come ahead to make arrangements. Hastings, too, continued his stories about the thousands of Mormons and other immigrants about to arrive. So Larkin wrote the Secretary of State in April the 2nd, Hastings is laying off a town at New Helvetia for the Mormons. <clears throat> but in April, Hastings and the guide James Kleiman led a pack train from Johnson's Ranch with 24 disillusioned eastern-bound immigrants, including women and children, and a man by the name of A.H. Crosby, who had accompanied Hastings into California less than four months previously. Hastings wrote for the, f uh, for the first time, quote, I am determined to go back as far as Green River or Bridger's Fort with a view to conducting the immigrants to this country by a better and a more direct route than that usually traveled. He indicated to John Sutter that he intended to bring immigrants via the route just traveled by Fremont, which he believed were 300 to 400 miles shorter than the route via Fort Hall. And after crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains, Hastings and seven others attempted to follow the trail Fremont had described. Hastings had been told there would be no portion of the trail more than 20 miles from fresh water. Believing they had lost Fremont's trail, they persevered for 30 hours without grass or water through a salt desert while heading east. Hastings finally reached uh, Sweetwater River east of South Pass and returned to South Bridger to Fort Bridger with the first western bound travelers of 1846 to persuade as many of them as possible to follow the cutoff. One immigrant, uh, Dr. P. Dr. Pope Long observed, we will take a nearer route crossing the country on the south end of the Great Salt Lake. This route will cut off at least 250 miles and is the one through which Captain Fremont passed last season. It is proposed by Mr. Hastings, who has been with us for some time. He came through on horseback and reports the route perfectly practical for wagons. Likewise, William Russell noted that Hastings offered to take them by the new route he claimed had been discovered by Fremont. He told this group, that the route would save them 200 miles while traveling through a fine farming country with plenty of grass for the cattle. On his way west again, Hastings was continuously scouting 
for this elusive trail. Now, Hastings' reputation was not significantly affected until many years later, but today his name is linked forever with the Donner Party disaster that followed. Perhaps a little unfairly, since he was not only deceived by what he had been told by Fremont, but also the safe travels of over 200 emigrants, notably the Harlan and Young parties, of almost 70 wagons just ahead of the Donner Party on the Hastings Cutoff in 1846 shows us that this disaster could have been avoided. Now, meanwhile, Kleiman continued to Missouri with the eastern bound pack train and safely packed away this time was a detailed letter by Robert Semple. It contained a comprehensive account of the Sacramento Valley, its resources, climate, agricultural potential, and a list of what emigrants should bring. It would be published in, the, in a St. Louis paper and reprinted in Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Greeley praised the letter, which he wrote, quote, gives the clearest and fairest account of the peculiar advantages and disadvantages of California as a country to settle and live in that we have met with, which will benefit those intending to emigrate thither. Now, realizing the potential appeal of this letter, Hastings made sure that all future editions of his immigration guide, now with a new name, and Hastings would publish five new editions of this guide between 1847 and 1857, would contain this letter as a new chapter entitled Sketch of the Country <clears throat> by the Honorable R. Semple. Now, just months after his arrival in California, Semple would become one of the leaders of the Bear Flag Revolt, a revolt Hastings had predicted, published the first newspaper in California, found the city of Benicia, and then in 1849 served as the president of the Cal California Constitutional Convention. Napoleon Smith and his brother would profitably sell goods to the gold miners in San Jose and Martinez. William Mendenhall would buy a large ranch in Alameda County, survey and sell town lots there, and found the city of Livermore. And Hastings, due principally to Brigham Young's determination not to proceed west of Great Salt Lake in 1846, Hastings could not attract the thousands of Mormons he expected would settle at Suttersville <coughs> or on another site he purchased and aid Montezuma on the lower Sacramento River. He was elected a delegate uh, from Sacramento to the California Constitutional Convention held in Monterey in the fall of 1849. He was one of the first three delegates to sign in along with his trail partner, Robert Semple, who was elected president, and John Sutter, his early host. Hastings was elected chairman of the Boundary Commission, which recommended boundaries for the new state, the, the Boundaries Committee, I should say. It was Hastings who recommended the eastern border of the state of California as we know it today, rather than a border much farther east. And one reason he gave was to allow his old friends, the Latter-day Saints, uh, a, a, to allow his old friends, the Latter-day Saints, to establish a territory of their own to the east. And after much debate, Congress would approve the Constitution and Hastings' boundaries of California a lasting legacy of Hastings' activities in 1845 that preceded his remarkable journey to California. Well, thank you. There may be time for a few questions.